Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents, and we welcome you to God's Church of Love Online. Get ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. Forgive me. Somebody just sent me a, a text. <laughs> Okay, that was a, um, yeah, that was a private joke. But anyway, Father, I ask you to anoint this message and get, get my attention back on your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now let's get serious. We ask for your heavy anointing, Father, please. Seriously. Okay. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of that coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Mm. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let me stop there just for a second. I notice it always talks about fleeing into the mountains. The one thing that I notice about people who walk with God, there is a natural prophetic uh, truth about walking with God that a lot of us overlook. And one of it is people who truly, truly thirst, hunger and thirst after God's righteousness and after him, always reach for higher ground. They reach for higher ground, figuratively speaking, when it comes to drawing closer to God and living above the dictates of the world, living above the dictates of our own flesh and our emotions and attitudes. But the thing that I notice, the Bible always has people, when they encounter God, when they deal with things of God, it always seems to be up in a high mountain, in a high hill, in an elevated area. I notice that. The Mount of Transfiguration. <clears throat> Mount Moriah. Uh, when Jesus, I mean, sorry, when Moses <clears throat> saw the burning bush and he came up higher, when uh, <clears throat> when the Lord had him fast and gave him the Ten Commandments, 
that the hand of God wrote himself. Where was he? Way up in the mountain. That's really something. That's really something how if you can keep your spiritual posture located in a high level, you will not succumb so easily to the mess that happens below. You will not be so easily swayed, so easily fooled. Now, I must get back to the word because this is a long read, but I just had to throw that little two cents in there. Okay. Verse 16 again. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath day. <clears throat> okay, I got to say this, you guys, because I don't really teach on it, but I just want to throw it in. There are particular scriptures. I know we live in the dispensation of grace, but the reason we meet on Saturday is because there are certain blessings. The promises of God, as much as it's promised to us, I have never lived to fulfill and see the fullness of his promises until I started observing the Sabbath. I didn't do it out of legalism because I know I'm going to heaven. I did it because I started reading the promises and I started researching and found out the Sabbath was never any other day but Saturday, but it's the seventh day of the week, basically. But the reason that we worship on Sunday is not, this is for all of you on YouTube, it is not because Jesus rose from the grave on a Sunday morning. It is because Constantine, I believe that's the name if I say it correctly, changed the laws to work along to cooperate with the pagans. And the pagans' day to worship their God was, their, they worshiped the sun god. And that's how Sunday got its name. So Sunday is named after the sun god. And because they worshiped the sun god on Sunday, Constantine changed the laws and decided to change the Sabbath worship time for all the Gentiles to, to worship on a Sunday. So when you look in the New Testament in the book of Acts and you look at them saying, the, the Gentiles calling on the disciples, can you come next Sabbath so that we can hear the word too? That's after Jesus was resurrected and gone. <laughs> so I just say this, I always go to God's best. I go to God's best diet. His diet in the first, in the beginning was fruit and vegetables, grain and nuts, all natural grown foods, not meats. Meats came after sin. So I just want to let you know that there are things you can observe that are not legalism. You don't have to. I don't think you have to. I'm not an expert on that. You may. I don't know. But my thing is, even if you go to church on Sunday like I do, okay, observe the Sabbath. You can go shopping. You can do your laundry on Sunday. You can do everything else. Clean the house all day long after you get home from church. But make sure that Saturday is consecrated to the Lord. That's the day that you don't do all that busy stuff. If you read Isaiah 58, you'll see why. It talks about removing your foot from observing the Sabbath. It words it strangely, but it means on that Sabbath, you remove your feet from doing your thing. from doing your fun, from doing your business, all that, and from working. So 
that's just a little tidbit. That's a, a little aside. You know, that's without charge. That's free. You know. Okay. Anyway, now we go into. Uh, let me see. Pretty. Okay. Verse twenty. Two, and except for those days should be shortened, except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, the, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert or uh, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning, check this out, check out the imagery here. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Instant, sudden, split second, he, boom, he's there. Okay. Verse 28, for whosoever, so, excuse me, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. See, that is the part that I don't like. I don't like that it says after the tribulation because that to me infers that we're going to be here. Anyway, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Let me re read that again. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branches yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is not. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and given to marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh. I'm going to repeat that because we all must be reminded of this. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? 
whom his Lord had made ruler over his household to give him meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. This is for us. Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise. And five were foolish. Pat's two cents. And I ask you, which are you? Wise or fool? They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Mm. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, in these last days, what do you see? You see people eating, drinking, being merry, right? Okay. You see people doing their own thing, leaning to their own understanding, having it their way. Okay. Um, if loving you was wrong, I don't want to do right. You know, that kind of thing. Talking about adultery and fornication and all that other mess. Well, knowing all that's going on in these last days, we have to be that much more sober. Number one, as I mentioned in the past, we have demons being sent, literally being dispatched, being set on assignment to bring down God's people. Satan already has the sinner. He's got them hook, line, and sinker. He got a ring right through their nose. But when it comes to God's people, there are some that are cold, there are some that are lukewarm, and there are some that are hot. And I ask you, stay hot. And for those that are cold, return to your father. Return to your first love. For those that are lukewarm, don't dibble and dabble in sin. Don't sleep with the devil and date the Lord by day. You go out with the devil at night when nobody's looking and you play with him and you let him play with you. But then you get up in the sunlight and you praising God in church and ha, hallelujah. And you doing all the little church gyrations and calisthenics and, and you got all the jargon and the verbiage down pat. You know how to talk church, but you know how to cuss up a storm and fight, kick and, and backstab and, 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 and roll in the sheets and all that other mess at night when nobody's looking. You live a double life. So you don't need to live a double life. You don't need to 
allow yourself to are muted. You don't need unmute themselves. You don't need to allow yourself to stoop that low. When you're living in these last days, this is not a time to take that chance because I believe when sudden destruction comes, I, I do believe we are in the beginning of sorrows. I really believe that. But when we look at the times, the seasons, the events, and everything that's going on now, what we have to be mindful of is we don't know how long this is really going to take. A lot of times the time span that the Bible deals with deals with days, years, and, and, and millenniums. So we don't really know you know, we can go by what we have studied and what we've researched and all that. But we have to remember that God's timetable, you know, when God says it's time, there's not going to be any more prayer that'll slow him down. When he puts that anvil, you know, how the judge bangs on, on his uh, surface. When he puts that anvil down and says, time, time up. It's going to be time. And when you see him bust through those clouds, it's going to be too late to get on your knees and ask him to forgive you. The Bible says when he comes, let him who is righteous still be righteous. Let him who is unrighteous still stay unrighteous. Because no matter what you do, you are what you are. When he comes, there's no turning around then. There's no last minute. Oh, wait a minute, Lord. Yeah, in the name of Jesus, please forgive me. No, no, no. It'll be boom, boom, be done. You, it's too late. Once you see them, it's too late. So you better get it right now. See, a lot of you think there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's, you know, Jesus was just a prophet and all that. I ask you this. You really want to take that chance? You really want to chance it? You really want to lay your soul you want to you want to chalk it all up to Buddha, Muhammad, Ali, all the I mean all these other gods, the all these these sex gods and this goddess of love and goddess of money and goddess of prosperity and goddess of whatever, whatever all your gods are. You really want to chance that. Now here, think about it. Think about this. A lot of you, I know some of you watch YouTube from other countries, so that's why I'm bringing this in. And some of you in America have brought your idols with you. You have them set up in your business place. But check out how you got you to gotta maintenance your idol, don't you? You got to dust them off. You got to put them in place. You got to, you put things in front of them. Whatever you do, the idol was made by man's hands. God was not. Think about that. You have to do whatever homage you do to that idol. But when you're in trouble, does the idol get off of that pedestal and come to your rescue? No. Does the idol speak to you? No. Does the idol have power? No. You might as well have a little doll baby sitting up there. You might as well have a little a little uh, candle or... or um, a lamp, a lamp stand, at least the lamp gives off some light. But what is that doing? It's just sitting there. Frozen. Can't move. Eyes can't see. Ears can't hear. Mouth can't speak. Heart, there's no heart, so there's no love. There's no spirit. There's no power. There's no nothing. Superstition is what causes so many to fall because they fall for anything. They believe the lies they've heard all those years, all, all, through, all through the generations. What I, what I mean, God described this so perfectly. They set this thing, they cut down a tree, they build up and, and, and some of the wood from that same tree, from that same stock, they cut some of it and they throw it in the fire and they warm their house with it. Some of it they use to cook their food. Some of it they use to build things, to build furniture. And some of it they use to carve out idols. Idols that man's hands have made. How can an idol that your hand made come to your rescue? 
Okay, I'm not trying to bash other religions. I'm really not. I'm trying to get you to see the logic in this. Because you cannot see God. You think he is impotent. You think he is basically non-existent. But you hear those of us tell you how God led us here, how God protected us there, how the name of Jesus has authority over dogs that come to attack you, how the name of Jesus has all authority over demons, how the word of God has authority and can drive out demons. Yet, you would rather pray. That's what Pharaoh did. When Moses brought the plague, the final plague that broke the camel's back was when he sent the plague to kill all the firstborn of Egypt. And he told God's people, make sure your blood is on you, the blood of the lamb is on your doorpost. So I say to all of you so-called born again Christians, you make sure the blood of Jesus is on your, on the doorpost of your heart. Because if you have not applied the blood of Jesus, you will succumb to all the mess and the judgment that's coming to this world in these last days. It will not be easy for you. And you will not have the intervention of God. But what I say, when you look at what they did in Egypt and they put the blood on the doorpost and the plague came, and they were instructed to stay in, don't look out there, don't get out there and be nosy. You just mind your business and stay inside. Dedicate your time to the Lord and each other. And let the plague pass you. That's where they get the name, the Passover. It passed over them. And it attacked all of the people that scoffed at God, that ignored God, that did not believe God. Because he's an invisible God, they thought impotence, whatever. That ain't about nothing. See, I got an idol. So what did Pharaoh do? Pharaoh and all the Egyptians prayed to their idols. What did the idols do? Nothing but sit there and collect dust. Because they were nothing but a piece of wood. Wood, iron. All the things that people made these idols out of, God made. God made the, the, the alloys to create brass and silver, gold. He, he, he grew the trees. Everything that man creates these handmade idols out of are made by God's hands in creation. So they take what belongs to God. They create a little makeshift something, something, and they bow to it and pay homage. Rather than obey the living God, have the power of the universe working on their behalf. But because God doesn't come down here and work all kind of little magic and hocus pocus and waving his little magic wand and doing all kind of tricks, you're mad because he doesn't work when you want him. <clears throat> He's not your bellhop. <coughs> He's not your taxi driver. He's not there to step and fetch. You don't order him around. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, gotta drink something. Just a minute. Mm. God is the ruler of the universe. Not your gopher. Hmm. Listen. All power is given to God. And see, a lot of you get mad at him because you pray prayers and you say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. What's up with that? Well, what's up with that is called P-U-R-P-O-S-E, purpose. God is a God of purpose. There are certain prayers that will never be answered the way you want them to be answered because it will take you off of your purpose or it will cause a chain of events that will bring devastation into your life. But some of you pursue it anyway. And when, when you do that, and God sees that you'd rather have your way than his, 
He moves his hand off of you and your circumstances. Now you are out from under the ark of safety. There is nothing there to protect you. And you are at the disposal of the enemy. And they can have their way with you because you'd rather play the fool than be wise. <clears throat> Many of you think that you can slip, you can peep, you can sneak around, mm -hmm. you can lie, you can play, play games, play your life away. Yeah, you can play the masquerade game, you can play the street life. I play the street life because it's the only life I know. But guess what? The street life has got a stinger at the end of it. Everything out there that you have been giving all your energy, all your money, all of your body to has got a stinger. It's a trap, a deadly trap. Many of us have been in the trap and thank God got out of it and turned to God. We, we, we saw the trap for what it is. We turned to God, Lord, deliver me. God did something inside of us, miraculous. Things that I didn't want to do, I wanted to do. Things that I wanted to do, I didn't want to do anymore. That wasn't a work of, of me. That was a work of God's miraculous power. No idol can do that for you. No stick figure, no statue, no, no dust collector will do that for you. You have got to remember, you, are, you have been playing for so long that you don't realize how close you are. You don't realize how close the day is. And there are two doggone many Christians who are out there cussing, fussing, fighting, fuming, stealing, lying, being being full of treachery, backstabbing. Oh, goodness. Stuck on pornography, stuck on crack cocaine, stuck on alcohol, stuck on cigarettes, stuck on uh, gambling, stuck on adultery, stuck on pedophilia, you have got all these hang-ups and, and trips and you're in a trick bag and there's a stronghold that's got you locked down. It's got you on lockdown and you're da locked down on the down low trying to play church when you go to church and fool the saints. But when God looks at you, he sees a fool. You're not fooling them. Satan is fooling you. Because you think that because you ask God to forgive you for sins, you ask God to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to spare you hell. Oh, you're in like Flynn. No, you're not. You know why you're not? Even though the Bible says sim it simplifies if you believe in Christ. But that doesn't stop there. Believing in Christ is a verb. It is not a noun. You don't just have belief. I believe that this wall, this door will open. I believe it. But if I never open it, I'll never know it. I believe there's clothes inside my closet. But if I never open it and get my clothes, the clothes will do me no good. So you have to not only believe, when you believe on Jesus, you have to believe through your behavior, through your character, through your words, through your actions, through your attitude, everything. You have to believe on Jesus Christ. The Bible says the devils believe, and this is how you know you don't have a shoe in. The devils believe. Now, does that make a devil saved? Think about it. No more than it makes you saved for believing. Because the devils have no righteousness in them. The Bible says the devils believe and tremble. 
and that's as far as it takes them. They're still an agent of hell, an agent of the devil. They're still evil, evil, evil. Nothing good in them, no truth in them. When Jesus comes, they want to run and scatter. They don't want anything to do with him because they know who he is. They're scared of him. That's why they tremble. And you refuse to fear the Lord in these last days? Really? You will be afraid of your boss on the job. He can say, he can say jump and you say hi hi. <laughs> yeah, right. God says, thou shalt not. And you're like, <laughs> talk to me. Talk to the hand. I ain't got time for all them rules and regulations. So you mock God the same way they mocked Jesus when he was on the cross, dying, suffering for you and me, for all the world, past, present, and future. He died for all of us dingbats who didn't give a you-know-what about him. But he was loving us, baby, through his action, through his sacrifice. We were sinning, he was in pain. We were laughing and playing, he was up there taking all, he was taking all the whippings that we deserved, all the butt whoopings we deserved, he took on his back. And with every lash, every cut, in his back came our healing, our inner healing, our psychological healing, our deliverance, our freedom, our blessings. All that came with every, every whip that hit his back. You've seen pictures of the black slaves when they had the scar tissue that was left from all of the constant whoopings that they got from the whips that were done on them by the slave masters. And it just looked like a, a, a road mat, more, more scar than skin. That's the way Jesus' back was cut open. He was treated like a slave. And here you are. You deserve what he got. I deserve what he got because we were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. Nobody has to tell us to lie. Nobody has to tell us to be treacherous. Nobody has to tell us to screw with somebody else's husband or wife. Nobody has to tell us to uh, lie and cheat. Nobody has to teach us how to do it. It comes naturally because it's in our flesh. And here we have a savior who is pure, who is clean, who is holy, who is love personified. And we don't want to hear him. After all, if he went through for us, we don't want to hear him. We don't want shackles put on us. No, you already got the shackles. He wants to take the shackles off. But you think the shackles are jewelry. Satan has you so blinded that you think those shackles that have you locked down, that have, that have such a stronghold on you, you think that they are bracelets and necklaces, earrings. You think it's jewelry. That's how duped you are. That's how well Satan lies. You get somebody in your life that beats you down to the floor and sends you to the hospital. They tell you they love you. What do you do? You believe them. What? Please. Jesus does the ultimate show. He shows you his love by what he suffered on the cross. And what do you do? Oh, I don't feel like hearing that mess. I'm so tired of these Christians talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. The one that can remove all of your emotional pain. The one that can heal your body because it's on his back. The one that can remove your scars because your scars are on his back. He took them on his back. But you don't go to him to remove your scars. You don't go to him to free you up.
from the, from the devil's tricks. You don't go to him to deliver you from the bondage of the chains of sin. You don't go to him for that because you must have it your way. And you don't value real love. You don't know what real love is. So the one that bashes you upside the head and tells you you better do something, get down there and get that for me. Put my shoes on my feet. And you do it. You do it for the one that's beating you down. And you want to call Christians a fool for believing in Christ. What are you? I'm trying not to fuss. I'm not angry. I'm passionate because you're looking at somebody right here who knows what it's like to be out in the streets. I know the street life. I know what it, what it is to turn a trip in the back seat of a car. I know what it is <clears throat> to snort cocaine. I never was hooked on it because I just never got hooked on it, thank God. I know what it's like to be locked down and bound by a two-pack-a-day cigarette habit, having smoked for 15 years and not being able to quit, no matter what I did, couldn't quit. I know what it's like to not want to do something, but be bound to do it because I'm locked down. I'm tied up, tangled up in bondage. I know what it's like to hate and resent and have bitterness cooking my insides, eating me up. Ah, I know what that feels like. I know the misery that comes with it. It's not a fun feeling. I don't care how much you lie and try to make it smell and taste like chocolate. It's doo-doo every way you look at it. It's crap. I know what it feels like to hate myself, to be insecure, to feel like a nobody. I know what it feels like to live in fear, petrified of people, petrified of what they think about me, petrified of what they might say about me. <gasps> Ooh. Somebody could look at me cockeyed, not, and I'm just being facetious, but they look at me with an attitude and they could be sitting up there mad at somebody else. I take it personally and, and worry about that for a month. Come on, but too afraid to ask them. Just walking in fear, just a, 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 a load of fear, a mound of fear, bound by it. Insecurities galore, felt like a nobody. Would lay down with Tom, Dick, and Harry just so that the sex would somehow, it would make me feel like I was desirable and somebody might love me. And, oh my, and you're going through all these calisthenics bowing to people who don't wouldn't know their own behind if it was up on a neon sign you're bowing to these people that don't care about you they use you they abuse you they trick you they play you they lie to you they abuse you some of them even try to kill you and because you're so desperate and needy, you go for the okie doke again and again and again and again, and you're ignoring the signs of the times. You're not looking at what's going on around you because you're too busy scratching and digging and scratching and digging. Somebody love me. Somebody want me. Somebody tell me I'm sexy. Somebody tell me I'm handsome. Somebody tell me I'm all that in a bag of chips. Tell, tell me, tell me, give me, give me. I'll do whatever you want. I'll bow, I'll give, I'll die, whatever you want. Women, girls out there selling their behinds for some man whispering lies in their mouth. Giving the money to the boy. <clears throat> you do all that. Hating what you're doing. But you're so busy begging, scratching, and digging for love. That boy doesn't know what love is. He doesn't even know who he is. But he knows he can play you because you're worse off than he is. You're just that needy. 
Some of you men, you don't believe in yourselves. So what do you do? You dish out the money and you buy the woman this and buy the woman that. You buy the woman the other and you're bowing and bowing and anything she wants is you. It, it's your command and you obey. Even when you don't want to obey, even when you know you're being used because you got to have a woman. It makes you feel validated. Why do you need validation? Because you don't know who you are. I don't care how much money is lying in your pocket. You don't have a clue. And you'll never have a clue until you accept Jesus in your heart. And when God tells you who you are, you'll know, baby. You'll have purpose for the first time in your life. And all that other crap that's on his back will finally start coming off of you. And you'll start seeing the chains drop off of you. And freedom gets stronger and stronger in your life. And you get a sense of who you are. That's when the growth begins. That's when the blossoming and the beauty begins. But you have to be about doing that. You can't be claiming, oh, yeah, 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 Jesus. Yeah, yeah, man upstairs. Uh-huh, yeah, he, he's for me. I, I, I pray to him every day. Yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's good. Yeah, he understands me. He understands my heart. Turn right around. You, MF, blah, 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 blah. Come on, huh? I got something for you. Fighting and fussing and fuming and screwing and lying and cheating and stealing and everything you can get your hands to do. Feet swift to mischief. In these last days, you see the signs, you see what's going on. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're playing Russian roulette with the enemy of your soul? Well, I guess if you let somebody beating up on you, somebody spending up all your money and, and playing games with you, I guess if you're willing to let people do you like that, you don't even know that the invisible devil is the one trying to tear you down and pull you straight to hell. And then when somebody tries to tell you about heaven, you're so disillusioned, you just can't believe that. How can you believe that? But you'd rather believe a lie. Because the lie feeds your ego, feeds your flesh. The lust of the eyes. <laughs> yeah. The lust of the flesh. Ooh, give it to me, baby. And the pride of life. Hey, now. Selfie, selfie. I'm all that and a bag of chips. Going straight to hell in a handbasket. Because you're so busy going for the fluff. Going for the glitter, the glam, the lies, the sham. But you won't go for God, the one, the lover of your soul, the lifter up of your head. I am really, really using self-control because it is so discouraging to see how many people, some of you, even who live lifestyles that you know in your knower, you know deep down within, it ain't about nothing. You know you're not going anywhere, you know. But you have so much pain that sex becomes a drug. So you lay down with this one, you lay down with that one. You know you're not gonna enjoy it that much, but Using up that time and busyness, even if it's sex, to you is better than being alone and idle. Because if you're alone and it's too quiet around you, you have to deal with me. You have to deal with me, myself, and I. You got to deal with yourself. And you don't like what you got to deal with. So you want to ignore it. You want to turn the blind eye to all of your frailties, all your faults, all your weaknesses, all your down sittings, all your infirmities, all your problems, all your inadequacies, all your fear. You know, no, 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 no. You don't want to deal with that. So come on, baby. You want to go make love? Take me somewhere. Where are we going? Let's go out. Let's go hang. Let's go party. Let's go get high. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Anything but deal with me. No. The two, Pete, the two that you avoid the most in these last days is you and God. What is up with that?
I got to stop because I can go on and on and on. And I'm not trying to fuss. I'm really not. I'm not trying to fuss. Help me, Lord, please. I don't know who this is for. I just feel like I'm supposed to say it. For those of you who live in fear, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You don't have to live in a state of confusion. You don't have to live under someone's rule, heavy thumb over you taking dominion over you, abusing you, using you, just, just, you don't have to live under that kind of intimidating, intimidating fear. You don't have to live under this falsified love that I love you, I love you. Don't you want to be with, don't you want to be by your man? Don't you want to be by your woman? Don't you believe in me? If you believe in me, if you believe, guilt tripping, manipulating, narcissistic control. No, that's not God. God is love. And you living in fear rather than love. Perfect love which is God, cast out fear. Fear is not of God. Fear has torment. Ah, but you rather live there. That's all you know. Mm. I just ask you, please reconsider. Just because you don't see God's people living high on the hall does not mean that because you come to Christ you're supposed to live a life of poverty. No, that's not even what it's dealing with. The richness, the, the prosperity that happens is in here. You can have money galore, living, having houses all across the whole mountaintop over there with all the views around the whole canyon. But guess what? If you can't walk, if you don't have eyesight, if you're miserable and depressed, if you're bound by paranoia, fear, if you're angry, bitter, disgusted, frustrated, full of rage, all that money in the world ain't gonna do nothing for you. You can play the game, you can play the masquerade, but nobody really sees the misery that you have to deal with 24 seven. See that misery you gotta deal with, money can't, can't, money can't remove it. Money can't buy it away. There are some born again Christians that are blessed, some that get by and some that are downright poor. Their needs are still met, but they can't live big like you. But while you think you're living big, you hate the ground you step on because you hate you. That's where you're poor. You're much poorer than the woman who has to get food stamps to feed her kids, but they worship God every day. See, you don't get the magnitude, the, 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 oh, okay, okay, I'm, I gotta stop. I'm trying to help you see it, and I don't want to do it in my own strength. It, the Holy Spirit will have to open your eyes. Whatever I've said, just let it suffice. You need Jesus. You must be born again. And the only way that you're going to be ready when Jesus comes is if you relinquish your rights, all your rights, to have it your way in your life. Because once you do that, baby, you realize God's way is so much better and gets so much better results for you. Okay. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and those of you who have already done so, but you're not living anything, Ask God to put a hunger and thirst in your heart for righteousness. Ask God for mercy 
and that the Holy Spirit would convict you and make you disgusted with sin, disgusted with the ways you have that are so sinful and diametrically opposed to the character of God. You want to be ready when Jesus comes. Because I'm telling you, right at the time when we least, see, everybody's looking now, but when we least expect it and everybody lets down their guard, boom, he's going to be here, buddy. And he's going to catch too many of you with your pants down in every sense of that word. Watch. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. For the time is growing short.